Um, we are thrilled to be presenting our first artist talk in this, our new gallery um, at the Museum of Science. The gallery is intended to present work at the intersection of science and art and technology by artists whose groundbreaking work will encourage our visitors to re-examine their own perspectives. Tonight, we're fortunate to have an artist who is doing exactly that. Um, Chris Jordan is the artist behind Running the Numbers, Portraits of Mass Consumption, the exhibit which was curated here at the Museum of Science. And it has been waking people up since it opened. Chris is an internationally acclaimed artist who comes to us from his home in Seattle. He calls himself, as well as an artist, he calls himself a cultural activist. And his large format photographs portraying raw statistics really do make a huge impression on everyone who sees them. But before I say anything else, I'm going to turn things over to a young man on whom Chris has made a very special impression. Please join me in welcoming Jacob Feeney. Um, I was able to visit the museum a few months ago, and while I was here, my family, with my family, we visited this, the Running the Numbers exhibit, and all the pictures were, the portraits were really amazing, and I wanted to learn more, and after going to Chris's website, I was able to email him, and fortunately, I was able to get an interview over the phone with him, and because of that, I was able to write a, a report, and he has greatly helped me with the understand, more awareness of what consumerism uh, is, and I think we will be getting a lot of um, good insight tonight. Um, please welcome Chris Jordan. Jacob is in eighth grade and came down from Vermont to greet and meet Mr. Jordan in person. That's not what I thought I would be when I grew up, someone who takes photographs of giant piles of garbage. But uh, it's something I sort of came to um, quite, uh, it, actually it kind of came to me because I've been photographing for about 25 years as a hobbyist and I never had any interest in mass consumption up until quite recently. And up until about eight years ago, the photography that I did was very detached from the world, as, as a lot of art is. You know, I, I, uh, I was taking photographs of things that were just beautiful to me. And I had this artistic theory that I applied in my work that was one of those art theories that, you know, when you go to the gallery and you read the artist statement on the wall, you have no idea what the person's talking about. <laughs> it was like one of those, kind of esoteric and intellectual. And uh, for me, I realize now that what that was all about was avoiding facing the harsh reality of our world. I was afraid to engage. I was afraid to become a citizen. Because first of all, I thought if I engaged, I would have to give something up. And, uh, and also, I, was, I think I was afraid of being overwhelmed by the, uh, the horrors of our world if I really faced it. And so for years and years and years, I took photographs of, of beautiful things that had very little to do with what's actually happening in the world. And I call that my calla lily period. And, uh, and then one of the pictures that I took in that process of just taking photographs of beautiful things is I took a picture of this giant pile of garbage. And the only reason I took this picture is because I thought the colors looked really beautiful. And I was working with this color theory at the time that was, uh, it was all about finding complex and beautiful palettes of color in places where we wouldn't normally expect to find that like on a pile of garbage, for example. So I took this picture thinking uh, that, that I, had, I had made a, a photograph that was just about color. And when I stood back at a distance and only looked at the color without looking at what the subject is, it looked to, to me like a little bit like a, an impressionist painting. And then it, when you get up close, you realize it's actually garbage. And I thought that was just kind of a, a cool visual uh, experience for a photograph. So I made a print of this picture and I hung it on the wall of my studio friends who are internationally well-known with 
was making prints for them, for their exhibitions. So they were over one day picking up their print and started talking about mass consumption. And at the time, it was kind of annoying to me because that's not what my work was about. <laughs> consumption, I'm not interested in mass consumption. But see, look at the way the colors, and on, and on the mundane subject, and I started talking about my color theory. And, and they weren't so interested in that. And, uh, and one of them said, you know, Chris, what I see when I look at this picture is a macabre portrait of America. And I thought, huh. And then he put his arm around my shoulder in a, in a really sweet, friendly way. And he said, you know, Chris, I think maybe just by good luck, he finally made a relevant photograph. <laughs> and I was like, yes! <laughs> and, uh, he urged me to kind of follow this as a thread. And so I started going back to these places all around Seattle and around uh, the United States where I could stand in front of these giant piles of the detritus of our mass consumption. And as I, as I did that, I began reading about mass consumption. It's something I just never really cared about and never, never was interested in. As I started reading about it, I discovered to my amazement that there's this vast body of literature, hundreds of books and articles uh, and websites that go, well, the websites don't go back 100 years, but the books and articles do, of these visionary people in, in our culture who have been warning us for the longest time about the destructive and deadening effects of overconsumption on our environment, on our culture, and on our individual spirits. And I began to kind of see this issue appear before my eyes that I had never cared about, never been interested in, that had been profoundly affecting my own personal life. Because I was a lawyer making tons of money, spending all my money on stuff, and I was depressed and, and, and very anxious and angry, and I hated my life. I hated what I was doing with my life. And I was, I was lost in what I now see is the consumer lifestyle, and, and what I now call the, the American nightmare, as opposed to the American dream. As I began to read these books and, uh, and experience mass consumption for the first time, to kind of engage this issue, I began to see how huge it is. And I began reading the, the symptoms in our culture of, of a people who have gotten themselves lost. Millions of Americans, even wealthy Americans, on antidepressant drugs, Prozac and so on. And high rates of suicide among wealthy people, wealthy professionals, lawyers, doctors, accountants, business people, and so on. And high rates of, of rage, road rage, and, uh, and domestic violence, and anxiety, and, and, these other, and, and depression, these symptoms of, of, of a cultural, a culture-wide problem where we've kind of gotten ourselves lost off the track of what it really means to be American, I think. And as this, as this new issue sort of became, uh, came into view for me, I saw how huge it is and how pervasive it is and how we're affecting other cultures in the world and we're affecting our environment. And I slowly began to become more and more frightened and uh, alarmed by it. And so my own personal aesthetic began to kind of descend into a darker and more visceral place with my work. So I spent about a year or so making these photographs of, of giant piles of the stuff we waste. There's a, a, a whole bunch of uh, computer hard drives. And this, this is an image where you stand back at a distance and it looks like one thing. And what I hope it looks like when you look at this one is you're flying over a, like a, a dark industrial city of the future where there's no nature left or maybe the Death Star in Star Wars. Um, and, uh, and then when you get up close, what you see you're actually looking at is lots of computer hard drives. And this was the first image that I created where it, it, was, it looks like something different from a distance than when you come up close. And uh, I really like that as a visual metaphor because our consumption is kind of like that. You know, when you stand back at a distance from our mass consumption, it looks pretty good. You know, like it looks like all the, the, the jets we get to fly and the nice rooms we get to have talks in and the nice cars we get to drive and all the nice things that we Americans get to have in our lives. But when you zoom in close and you look at just one issue, you know, like, like our cell phones, the minerals that are inside our cell phones that come from mines around the world that, are, that, that slaves work in and that children work in and that are damaging the environment. You know, you, look at, you zoom in and look at one issue like that and you just see a really different picture than you saw when you're standing back at a distance. So I'm interested in this as a visual metaphor, and you can kind of see it in, in all of my work since then. 
So as I, as I did this series that I call Intolerable Beauty, these are all straight photographs that I went and took of, of actual piles of stuff. And one of the things I, as I got near the end of the series, one of the things I really wanted to do was to try to, uh, to, to take photographs of the actual quantities of the things we waste. Because I would go to these places and take photographs of like a big pile of garbage or a big pile of crushed cars or a whole bunch of cell phones on the ground. But it was always just a small quantity compared to the actual amount of things that we waste. You know, and like this, this picture is uh, just a few thousand cell phones, maybe 2,000 or 3,000 or something like that. And that's a tiny, tiny percentage of the 130 million phones that we throw out in the United States every year. At least that's what the number was back then. It's gone way up since then. And so what I was hoping to do with these photographs is to show the scale of our mass consumption. But I wasn't really accomplishing that because there's no way I could show the scale of our mass consumption because it's divided out over thousands, hundreds of thousands of different locations. Like there's no Grand Canyon of garbage that I could go to and like photograph all of our garbage. Like a Mount Everest of our, you know, of our, of our old cars or our old computers or whatever, where it all goes and you could stand in front of it and see it all. There's nowhere we, you can go and experience our mass consumption with your senses. And as a photographer, that kind of put me in a hard place because that's what I'm used to doing. I'm used to going with my camera in front of something and taking a picture of it. And there's nowhere I could go and photograph the cumulative effects of our mass consumption. And so that's what, that was the inspiration for this new series called Running the Numbers that, uh, that's exhibited here, <coughs> is to digitally construct images that, that illustrate the actual quantities of the things we consume. Um, let's see, what is the next one I've got teed up? Oh yeah, I want to, uh, I just want to tell you how I make some of these. Um, and uh, this, this is the cell phones one that's hanging right over there. 426,000 cell phones is one day of our cell phone consumption. And uh, the place I went to to photograph cell phones, they process about 50,000 cell phones a month through this place, but the most they ever have that we could dump out on the ground was a few thousand. So there's nowhere I could go. I, I looked all over to try to find a place where I could go photograph 426,000 cell phones, and there's no such place. And so instead what I did was I asked my cell phone friend if he would send me a box of a few hundred cell phones all the same color, because I wanted to make it a big silver mass of phones that sort of look like noise on a, on a TV screen. So he sent about that many cell phones. And I just made a little pile on the ground, and it was a pile maybe as big around as this table right here and just about that deep, just a, not very many cell phones. So I set my camera up looking straight down on them, took a picture, so now I have a, a nice 10 megapixel <coughs> digital photograph of 200 cell phones. Well, then I stir the phones around, took another picture, and it's the same distance and the same focus and the same colors, like everything's the same. So I can then take those two images in Photoshop and put them together, and then very carefully stitch out the, the edge between the two pictures. Well, now I've got a 20 megapixel photograph of 400 cell phones. And if I just do that again, stir them again, take another picture, stir them again, take another picture, and do that a lot, <laughs> a really lot, for a few weeks, <laughs> and I finally end up with that photograph over there. And uh, as, I, as I go, I just count up, I just keep track of how many phones I'm pasting until I finally reach the statistic that I'm trying to depict. And what I end up with is a, a several gigabyte image file in Photoshop that has this strange characteristic that, that I didn't think of in advance. It just happened that way. But when you walk up close, you see more and more detail. And it's, I, I like that about these images because usually when you, you know, if you go to an art gallery and you see like a five by 10 foot photograph, when you walk up really close, it kind of gets pixely, you know, or you see film grain or something like that. It just kind of falls <coughs> apart like if you put your nose this far away from the print. So there's, a, there's like a viewing distance for most really large photographs. And with these ones, because each one is actually made up of thousands of smaller photographs, as you walk closer and closer, it, there's this kind of weird Google Earth zooming in experience of like, whoa, look at all of those. And uh, that, that I, I experienced that the first one of these that I made, and I realized it was as a, as a technique that I could use. So I, I, uh, I started experimenting with more and more of them. Um, I think maybe I'll talk about a couple of the, the ones that are on the wall. 
Uh, this one here is uh, one million plastic cups, which is the number of cups that are used on airline flights alone in the United States every six hours. And I made that one, <laughs> made that one out of one plastic cup that uh, I brought home from an airline flight and, and uh, just took a picture of it and then trimmed off the lip of the cup uh, in Photoshop and just pasted a picture of the lip and then pasted that a hundred times until I had a stack of cups. And then I just bent it all around in, in different shapes in Photoshop so it looked like sections of pipe. And then I had this little palette over here with a bunch of sections of pipe and I just started building pipes and uh, ended up with what hopefully looks like a kind of neo-Gothic cartoon drawing of a factory spewing out pollution. But uh, a friend of mine looked at that and he said, no, that's the freeway intersection from hell. <laughs> what, the, what the Los Angeles freeway system's gonna look like in another thousand years or something. And there, there are a few themes that have emerged as I have begun to do this work. Um, and uh, one of them is, uh, I guess the, the real motivation behind this series is that every day we, we receive all these, this information about these phenomena that are happening in our world, whether it's global warming or the number of people in the world who don't have access to safe drinking water, 1.2 billion people in the world who don't have safe drinking water, or the number of people in prison or the number of trees that get cut down to make the paper for junk mail. Like there are all these phenomena that are happening and the only information we have about these phenomena, to try to relate to these phenomena, the only information we have is these gigantic numbers. You know, like 100 million trees are cut down in the United States alone every year just to make the paper for mail order catalogs. You know, and we hear, we hear numbers like this, 100 million trees. And the thing is, the, it's, been, it's been demonstrated by sociologists that the human mind doesn't have the capacity to comprehend numbers more than a few thousand. And, and yet, we're trying to understand the world based on these numbers in, in the hundreds of thousands, or the millions, or the billions, 210 billion plastic bottles used in the United States every year. Like, that's a, it sounds like a big number, but if I said, actually, that's not what the number is, it's actually 420 billion. It doesn't register any differently. Or actually, that isn't really the number, the number is 840 billion. I just multiplied it by two again. That doesn't register, it's just like, such a big number that we can't really make any sense of it. And the problem is that's the only information we have about this profoundly important phenomena that, uh, that is causing an environmental catastrophe. And if we can't comprehend that information, if it just kind of, I mean, it, for me, it doesn't even go in one ear and out the other. It goes in one ear and back out the same ear without even registering anything. <laughs> and if that's the only information we have, then perhaps that's part of why we're kind of disconnected from these issues and why we're having such a hard time mustering the, the will, the collective will, to act about it. And so this is my hope with these photographs is to take these numbers out of the kind of dry, incomprehensible, unfeeling language of gigantic numbers with lots of zeros and to translate them into a visual language that might allow us to relate to these issues and maybe feel something about them. Because when we feel you know, when we get angry or when we get, when we feel grief about what's being lost, about the, the species that are being lost, or if we feel anxious or if we feel frightened, that's when we act, is when we feel something deeply. And I think we're having a hard time feeling these issues that, are, that we see happening out in the world. So I want to show you a few uh, images that aren't in the exhibition. And I don't have a, a timer, and I know we're supposed to keep it down to half an hour, so Maybe just somebody let me know when I've gone like way over. <laughs> You're about three minutes in, Chris. Oh, <laughs> great. Um, well, I want to show you this piece because uh, I, I did this piece back when I had a little bit of a finger waggy attitude early on in this process. And, and uh, I want to share with you a little bit about what happened for me there. Um, I realized as I began to engage with the, the green movement, I started doing some good things, like driving a small car and not drinking water out of plastic bottles. And I started feeling a little uh, smug that I was doing, oh, thank you, doing my part to save the world. And so then I, I kind of got this attitude of wagging my finger at people who weren't doing those things. And so I drive a small car, and so I had this finger-waggy attitude about people who drive SUVs. 
And so I made a piece about the, the GMC Denali SUV. And it didn't take me long to, you know, I started sort of looking a little, a little more holistically at my life and looking at how much f flying I was doing on jets, for example. I flew to Dubai last year to give a half an hour talk about my work at the World Economic Forum. And that's halfway around the world and back. So I flew the entire way around the world last year for one talk. And I thought about, and I, I measured the, I did the, the calculation for the carbon footprint of that. And that's larger than the carbon footprint that most people have in their entire lifetime elsewhere in the world. One flight around the world. And I think of how many people drive Humvees and what their carbon footprint is. And I don't know if their carbon footprint is better or worse than mine, but I suspect mine's probably worse. Because the flight to Dubai was one of like 30 flights I took last year in jets. So if I kind of look at my life with a little more perspective, I realize I'm in no position to wag my finger at anybody about any environmental uh, issue. And I've, I've slowly begun to realize that what, what, what I want to do is simply present the facts, present the reality of our world, and, and, and then let people who see my work make choices for themselves. And because I, it, I, I think a lot of the issues that I, that I try to depict are things that we aren't really aware of. You know, it's like we all have these behaviors that we do that are unconscious. You know, if it's uh, biting our fingernails or drinking too much alcohol when we go to a party or whatever thing, like we, we get into these unconscious behaviors and if we notice what we're doing, we suddenly become aware, oh yeah, I did that again. Then we have a choice that we didn't have when it was unconscious. And I think we're engaging in all these unconscious behaviors like drinking 12 ounces of commercially <coughs> processed sugar water out of 106,000 aluminum cans every 30 seconds and throwing it in the garbage. It's like we're doing these collective things that are causing a, a, an environmental catastrophe. And if we can just become aware of them collectively, then perhaps we can begin to make new choices about these things. So I went to uh, a GMC dealer and uh, told him that I wanted to buy a Denali SUV for my wife. <laughs> so I took that picture of a white one and then a picture of a gray one and a picture of a black one. <laughs> and uh, I tweaked around the letters a little bit. That was kind of an easy pun. And, uh, and then I made a 10-step grayscale of Denali logos. And this is in honor of Ansel Adams' zone system. And then I started putting together all these Denali logos uh, into a gigantic image of 24,000 Denali logos. And uh, that's, that's a picture of the real Denali. That's Ansel Adams' famous photograph of Mount McKinley in Denali National Park. And it's made of 24,000 Denali logos, which is six weeks of sales of the Denali SUV back in 2004 when SUVs were at their peak. One of the other themes that I'm interested in with this, this work is the relationship between the individual and the collective. And uh, I think this is a really important issue that, that all humans are facing right now. It's like as we, as we become aware of this vast world that we live in, and the vast number of people and the vast number of complex issues as we, you know, as we kind of develop this much more sophisticated worldview than anyone in the past has ever had because now we have access to so much information via the internet. As we each become aware of how huge and complex and messed up our world is right now, it's really hard to keep a sense of the, that each one of us can make a difference, you know, that we matter. And in the green movement, there's this constant message that you hear coming about how, oh yes, everybody matters, and every vote counts, and you too can save the world. And that's true, there's a truth in that. But there's this other truth that I think we aren't talking about so much that, that I'm trying to face, like this question I'm trying to face in my work, which is like when I walk out of my studio to, to, uh, to, to spend a few days traveling somewhere, I always wonder, is it really going to make a difference if I, if I bother to bend down and unplug the little modem so that green light goes off? Like, does it really make a difference? Do I really make a difference? Not through my artwork, but through my own personal consumptive behaviors. Like, would it really make a difference if I stopped drinking water out of plastic bottles? Would it really make a difference if I decided to be a vegetarian just to not participate in the and the environmental and, and cruelty, the, uh, the environmental problems and cruelty that go along with 
the farming of meat? Like, can I, does it actually make a difference if one person changes their behavior that way? And the sense that I have inside is I'm not so sure. It's like I want to believe the, the Green Movement's message about how every vote counts and how every one of us matters. On the other hand, I, I want to keep living a, a, a luxurious lifestyle. You know, I don't want to give stuff up. And I'm afraid if I do give things up, like eating meat or flying, taking vacations on jets, I'm afraid my life's going to suck and it's not going to make a difference. And I think everybody's kind of wrestling with this question right now. It's all like, how much, how much personal sacrifice should I make to, if it doesn't even really make a difference in the world? Because there are millions of other people out there who aren't going to make that sacrifice. And, like, and so I'm just interested in this question of, does the individual matter? And so with each one of these pieces, what I do is I create this big collective. When you stand back at a distance, you, you kind of see the collective and you can't see any of the individuals. And then when you walk up close, you see that the collective is made up of lots and lots of little tiny individuals. And on one hand, you could read these images as, well, if you took out one of those cups or if you took out one of those cans, it would leave a gap. So every individual matters and every individual is contributing to the whole. But on the other hand, if you went over to the plastic bottles piece back there and took out one of those two million plastic bottles, you'd never be able to tell the difference. And so it's, it's just my way of kind of raising this question. And I don't have any answers about it, but I, I think it's something, it, I think it's just a good thing to think about right now. Let's see, what else do we got here? Oh yeah, I uh, took a photograph of the light bulb in the lamp right next to my computer in my studio. Took the light bulb out and took a picture of it. And, uh, and then just started pasting light bulbs like crazy onto a gigantic canvas in Photoshop. So we're gonna zoom back, because this is the, the very middle of a much larger piece. I did this piece for IBM. Um, IBM is involved in, uh, in creating the smart grid. And so they wanted to show how much electricity is being wasted. So uh, I decided to use these light bulbs. We're slowly <laughs> zooming further and further back. And, uh, it ends up hopefully looking like a photograph from the Hubble Space Telescope of a nearby globular cluster. This is 320,000 light bulbs, which is equal to the number of kilowatt hours of electricity that are wasted in the United States every minute from uh, inefficient residential electricity use. So this is all our computers in sleep mode and our appliances plugged in and our lights that stay on all night and our air conditioners with the windows open and all, you know, just all, all the ways we waste electricity. So after a while, I, uh, I, I began to learn about other issues other than just mass consumption. And uh, I, I thought mass consumption was, was the issue for a while. And when I started learning about, for example, the 1.2 billion people in the world who don't have safe drinking water, I learned that that's the leading cause of death on Earth, is dehydration and diarrhea, primarily in young people from people who don't have access to the most basic thing, and that is safe drinking water. 1.2 billion people. And I thought, well, if you went and asked one of those people what's the most important issue on Earth, they definitely wouldn't say mass consumption. They would say drinking water. And I started learning there's, there, there are lots of issues out there that are just as important and just as, just as enormous and just as frightening as mass consumption. And so I decided what I would, what I would do is to kind of turn, turn my attention with this Running the Number series toward some of those issues. And uh, one of them that I wanted to address is, uh, is the prison population we have in the United States. I was astonished when I first started researching this to discover that the United States has the largest prison population of any country on Earth, measured two different ways. We have 2.3 million people. That was in 2005, we had 2.3 million Americans that were incarcerated. And it's been about the same ever since. About two and a half million people are, are incarcerated in the United States every year. Well, there's no other country in the world that has that many people in jail, including China, that has a population more than four times the United States, and <coughs> India, which has a population about four times the United States. But more troubling to me is the fact that we have the largest percentage of our population incarcerated of any country on Earth. That includes all the countries that we like to point our fingers at as being the, the evil dictatorships that are the enemies of freedom. No other country has a higher percentage of its population incarcerated than the land of the United States. It's a strange thing to think about, and I have no idea what the answer is because we, we arguably have the best legal system in the world, the best criminal justice system. We give people due process, and at least they get a trial. You know, 
criminals are, are, uh, are executed in other countries. And uh, I was showing, uh, talking about this issue with some fourth graders recently, and this little girl raised her hand and she said, well, isn't, don't we have 2.3 million people in jail just because we have the best police? And I think, well, yeah. yeah that, that's a factor too, maybe. So I don't know what the answer is, but I'm, I'm deeply troubled by the fact that we have the largest prison population of, of any country on earth. And I wanted to show 2.3 million of something. So I, uh, I rented 50 prison uniforms from a, a Hollywood uh, costume rental place. You know, one of those giant warehouses where they can outfit like an entire Civil War battle or, or whatever. Um, and uh, they had locked prison. So they sent me 50 prison uniforms. After I sent them back, I thought, dang, you know what I should have done is gotten 50 of my friends. We all put the prison uniforms on and like run around downtown Seattle and say, we got out, we got out! <laughs> It was after I said it back, I thought of that. So, so uh, I stacked these up on my studio table and took a picture and then stacked them into a different stack and took another picture and took hundreds of photographs of, uh, of prison uniforms and just digitally in Photoshop started pasting them all together into a gigantic image of 2.3 million prison uniforms. And uh, in, in the actual piece, in the final piece, each prison uniform is the size of a dime on its edge. So imagine how tiny that is, how thin that is. You have to walk all the way up and, and just about put your nose on the print to be able to see what it is you're looking at. Even like standing back at arm's length, you just see this kind of orange texture. And, uh, and even at that size, like th this is where I got the title for the series, Running the Numbers, is I ran the numbers to figure out if, if each prison uniform takes up a sixteenth of an inch by a quarter of an inch, how big does the print have to be to show 2.3 million of them? And I was astonished when the final result was 10 by 25 feet, which is fairly close to the size of this entire wall right here. Not quite that big, but almost. And uh, it was weird because I pasted every single one of those prison uniforms in there myself in Photoshop. And at the end, it, it, I can't remember how, how long it took me, but something like two months. At the end of it, I thought I comprehended 2.3 million. I thought I got that number. And I was shocked the first time I went uh, and, and saw this piece installed in a gallery in New York, where it is there, um, <coughs> and saw just how many that number is, and realized that every single one of those is an American who has had their liberty taken away for some reason that we call a crime. And uh, I just wonder if, if that's really the way we we, we ought to be dealing with people who make these kind of mistakes, because a lot of them are just mistakes. Anyway, um, it's, it's like one of these unconscious things. It's this system that has happened. And I don't want to point blame. I don't want to like, point the finger at anybody for being bad. And I don't even know who to point the finger at in terms of our justice system. But this is just where we're at today. This is the reality that we have. And if we all become aware of it, and we all start talking about it, then maybe we can begin to make new choices as we go forward. Another uh, kind of tragic epidemic that I learned about in the United States is the huge proliferation of breast augmentation surgery among women. And I read recently that 384,000 women in the United States last year when had elective breast augmentation surgery. And when I do one of these pieces, I always choose a piece that I'm personally implicated in. You know, like, I use plastic cups, and I used to drink out of aluminum cans, and I fly around on jets. And when I first read the statistic about breast augmentation, I thought, well, that's not something, you know, that, that's a women's thing. That's not something I want to do a piece about. And it took me about a nanosecond to realize that the reason this is happening is because women are being objectified by men. And this has been going on forever. And in our culture, there's a huge amount of it. And I started thinking about, you know, do I objectify women's bodies? And I, I, I have been guilty of that just like any other guy. And it makes me so sad to think that there's so much of it coming from so many men in the United States through photographs, through covers of, of fashion magazines, and through things like the, the Barbie doll that women, 384,000 women in the United States feel like they have to do this to, to be beautiful. And uh, 
And so I decided to make a piece about that. And I went around to all the thrift stores in Seattle and I bought all the Barbie dolls I could find. I chose the Barbie doll as an iconic example of the objectification of the female body. And it's a particularly scary one because these dolls are given to young girls before they're even really self-aware. And the, the implication in the Barbie doll is this is what beautiful looks like. And if you want to be beautiful, this is what you have to look like. And if you don't look like that, then you're not as beautiful as that. And, if, and of course, the Barbie doll, the figure of the Barbie doll is this impossible female figure that no woman has or would want to have. Um, well, except a few, those ones we read about in, down in Hollywood. Um, what's that woman's name? God, I just had $30,000 worth of everything to try to look like Barbie. Um, and, uh, and so I went and got 53 Barbie dolls from all the thrift stores in Seattle. And, uh, and they all came dressed. There was the, the nurse Barbie and the prom Barbie and the bathing suit Barbie and the army Barbie. And I had this really macabre evening in my studio undressing 53 Barbie dolls. <laughs> I hope the neighbors weren't looking in that evening. <laughs> and, uh, and so I laid them out in these florets um, and, uh, and took a photograph. And then I changed the florette around, you know, took out some of the dolls and put in some different ones and turned it and, and uh, made lots of different florets. And then I began pasting together lots and lots of these, uh, these photographs I'd taken of, of Barbie florets. So you can see lots of the little Barbie florets. And then when we finally step all the way back from the piece, it's uh, 32,000 Barbie dolls, which is the number of elective breast augmentation surgeries uh, in the United States every month. It's one month. And uh, it's a little vague, but when you stand back at a distance, hopefully what it looks like is a, is a pair of smallish, lopsided, but nevertheless beautiful, natural female breasts. And I learned as part of the research for this, I, I, after, I, uh, after I finished this piece, I learned that Breast augmentation is the second most popular uh, plastic surgery that's done in the United States. And the most popular is liposuction. And the majority of people getting liposuction are men. So really fascinating. I went and got a uh, one black dog collar and photographed it in lots of different configurations. You know, I photographed it straight. I photographed it curved and rolled up in a ball and in lots of different ways. Um, and then I, photo I, I got one white cat flea collar and photographed it lots of different ways, you know, bent this way and bent that way and facing this way and that way. And, uh, and then just started pasting lots of those images in Photoshop and creating a gigantic image. You know, when you stand back at a distance, it's uh, Charlie Brown and Snoopy. And this is 10,000 dog and cat collars, which is equal to the number of unwanted dogs and cats that are euthanized in the United States every single day. 10,000 a day. And uh, one of the themes that I work with in, in this series and in all of my work, it's like, how can I raise an issue that's that painful without people's defenses going up? Because it's hard to come out of denial and face the horrors of our world. You know, the fact that we're killing I think the number is it's almost 4 million dogs and cats in the United States every year just because we don't want them. And so one of the things I do with my work is I, I create it so that when you stand back at a distance, it, it looks kind of innocuous. You know, it looks, it looks approachable. It doesn't look scary. It doesn't look like it's going to be wagging its finger at you. It's just a oh, Peanuts cartoon or uh, with the print uniforms, th those, uh, those big orange rectangles. It's supposed to look like one of those kind of wank pieces of modern art. You know, it's just like, oh, six giant orange rectangles. <laughs> I, can, I can walk right up to that without any issue coming up. And, uh, and so I try to make them kind of approachable from a distance. And then when it gets all the way up close, suddenly it, it flips on them. You know, when you get up close, you're like, oh, that's not a Peanuts cartoon. It's lots of dogs and cats collars. And the defenses still aren't up, hopefully. This is my, my intention. And then only when you read the the label on the wall, the message is already seeped in, and then it's just like the sledgehammer goes <laughs> <laughs> So uh, all of the pieces in the, the first part of my Running the Number series were all uh, about American mass consumption. And lately, I've started to do issue, uh, face issues that are more global in nature. And so I, this one, which is, uh, this is about the Pacific garbage patch. 
And this piece is made of um, 2.4 million pieces of plastic that, uh, that came from the Pacific Ocean. I've been working with a marine scientist down in Los Angeles. You might have heard of this guy, Captain Charles Moore. Uh, he's been on the Colbert Report and a few other. He's, a, he's really putting the word out there about the enormity of the Pacific Garbage Patch. And he sent me a whole bunch of plastic from the Pacific Ocean. I used to construct this big image. Um, 2.4 million pieces of plastic is the number of pounds of plastic that are estimated to enter the world's oceans every hour. And, uh, and then I did this piece recently, which is about um, species extinction. Um, and uh, I was really shocked to learn recently from a, a biologist that we are right now in the middle of the largest extinction of species in the history of our planet. More animals and plants are going extinct right now than when the asteroid hit that killed the dinosaurs. And it's because of us. It's all because of us. And uh, no one knows exactly what the result of that is going to be, but huge limbs of the tree of life are being hacked off as we pave over and, uh, and pollute and overfish and so on. And uh, it's, it's an incredible tragedy. These are things that probably won't ever come back. Um, and uh, so one that I wanted to do a piece about was the tiger, because 2010 is the year of the tiger in the Chinese calendar. And so I made this piece. And uh, around the edge, you can see it's, all it is is just a frame. Around the edge of that frame is 3,200 tigers. When you walk up close, you see that there are all these little stuffed animal tigers. Um, these were made by a women's cooperative in Cambodia for, uh, to be given out to the people who went to the TED conference. And uh, I convinced the people at the TED conference to send me the whole 500 tigers so I could photograph them, and then I mailed them all back. Um, so I had all these tigers, and I made this piece of 3,200 tigers. That's the total remaining tiger population on Earth, including all the tigers in zoos, all the tigers in the wild, of all species of tigers. And uh, the space in the middle, if you filled that up with tigers at the same scale, it would be 40,000 tigers. And that's what the population of tigers was in the world in 1970. So this is, uh, there's, there's, there aren't many tigers left. And I, I, I showed this piece at a conference uh, a few days ago. Um, and a biologist came up to me and he said, it's not 3,200. It's gone way down since then. Nobody knows what the number is. But we're, our tigers are going to be gone very soon, very soon. Within maybe 10 to 20 years, the only tigers left will be in zoos. And they don't have the skills to, to uh, be let back out into the wild. And uh, they're not reproducing in zoos. So tigers are going to be extinct within most of our lifetime. We just lost the northern white rhino just uh, a few months ago. You may have noticed the, the little obituary in the, in the papers or the blogs or whatever. Northern white rhino went extinct. The last one on Earth died. And it's, it's just so sad to me. And I noticed that in, in American culture, it's, it's hard to be sad. You know, it's hard to have these feelings that we label as being negative feelings. You know, whether it's anger or grief or rage or anxiety or fear. Like, these are things that we, we like to think that we don't feel in America. You know, we're, we're all about happiness and everything's supposed to be fine all the time. But I think, I think these emotions are a natural part of being a human, especially right now. And I think if we could allow ourselves to grieve the, the incredible losses that are happening to this miracle that we all get to experience, the loss of the health of our oceans, the loss of our fish populations, the loss of our forests, the potentially irreparable damage that's being done to our atmosphere, to our biosphere, to our life support system, I think if we could grieve, or if we could allow ourselves to really feel it, to really connect with these issues, really feel how frightening it is, or feel how angry we are, or whatever our feeling is about that, then that's, that's the fuel tank that will drive passionate action. And uh, I've been facing these issues for a while myself. And my experience is that when I have allowed myself to really feel these things, it doesn't feel like a bad thing. I don't feel like I'm broken, or it doesn't feel like a bad experience. It just feels like a full rich experience of living an honest life in these times. And uh, one way that I'm trying to engage even further this way is to, uh, is, to, is to witness one really 
symbolic and, and horrible environmental tragedy that's going on in the world right now. And uh, that's on, it's happening on Midway Island in the middle of the North Pacific. And I want to tell you a little bit about my work. How are, we, how are we doing for time? When are we supposed to end? Am I over? And we're supposed to be done at like 6.30 or something? Oh, geez. All right. Uh, give me till 7, and then we'll, we'll do question and answer. Is that cool? We good? Yeah? All right. So I want to tell you about the work I'm doing on Midway Island. Um, the North Pacific Ocean is the world's largest open expanse of ocean. And if you look on a globe, or if you go on Google Earth and, and just look at the North Pacific, it's this vast body of water. It has the United States on one side, whoops, let's see. The United States on one side and Asia on the other side, and it's, it's uh, almost 5,000 miles across. Or four, yeah, almost 5,000 miles. If you put your finger right in the middle, then that's the remotest place on Earth, at least measured by the distance to the nearest continent. And right there, in the middle of the North Pacific Ocean, is Midway Island. And it's the place where the Battle of Midway was centered in World War II. And uh, it's also near the apex of the Pacific Garbage Patch. And the Pacific Garbage Patch, you, you probably have all heard of it. Um, wh what I first learned was that it's a floating island of garbage in the Pacific Ocean that's twice the size of the state of Texas. And the first thing I thought of when I heard that is my old cosmic color theory and I'm the guy who photographs giant piles of garbage, and I thought, wow, I'm gonna go there in a boat and take a photograph of horizon to horizon, colorful garbage. And I started talking to marine scientists about how to get out there, and I quickly learned that the Pacific Garbage Patch is actually much more frightening than that, because the plastic is all underwater, and it's broken down into infinitesimally small <coughs> pieces that are the size of plankton. You can't even see the plastic if you scuba dive in the water. The water just looks like it's ever so slightly milky out there. And it's millions of tons of, of our garbage. Plastic bags, plastic bottles, all this plastic stuff is made into the ocean and it slowly dissolves until the, you can't see anything left. But the molecules, of it, the individual molecules of plastic don't go away. They don't break down into anything smaller than a molecule of plastic. And they never will for the entire future of Earth. Until our sun expires, all the plastic that is in, in our ocean today will be there, unless we could come up with some kind of technology to remove it. And there are lots of scientists who are saying, forget it. It's like trying to take a gallon of milk out of the ocean after you dumped it in there. It's spread out, and, uh, and it's as small as the plankton. And the filter feeders that eat plankton, which is the basis for the food chain of the entire marine ecosystem worldwide, they can't tell the difference between plastic and plankton. And the guys who are going out into the middle of the North Pacific and studying, these, uh, studying the water out there are discovering that the ratio of pieces of plastic to plankton in the water is six to one. Six particles of plastic for every single plankton in the world's remotest ocean. And uh, I found this incredibly alarming, especially when you start to think about it building up in the food chain and you consider that half of the world's food is fish. It's much bigger than just a bunch of plastic in the middle of nowhere somewhere. So I started looking for ways to visualize the Pacific Garbage Patch, because it's another one of these invisible phenomenon that the only way we can learn about it is, is through these gigantic numbers, millions of tons of plastic. And, uh, and I learned about this phenomenon that's happening on Midway Island. So Midway is this tiny little island. It's about a mile and a half long by just a few football fields wide. It's a speck on the map in the middle of the North Pacific. And Midway is the nesting ground and the home for the Laysan albatross. Most of the world's Laysan albatross live right on Midway in a couple of smaller islands that are nearby Midway. And the albatross, uh, the pair of albatross, they mate for life. And once a year, they come back to Midway and they do this really beautiful mating dance and they, uh, they lay an egg. And they, they lay one egg, a pair lays one egg per year. And, when, and right on the ground because there are no uh, there are no predators out there. There are no mammals that would eat eggs or baby birds. So they can just lay their, their egg right in the ground. And when the baby hatches, one of the parents stays with the baby. The other parent flies out over the vast Pacific Ocean to fill its body cavity with squid and seaweed and, uh, and nutrients to bring back and feed to the baby through regurgitation, the way all birds feed their babies. Well, the vast majority of what's out there floating in the surface of the Pacific Ocean 
is not squid and seaweed, it's our plastic garbage. And the albatross can't tell the difference because for millions of years they've been flying out over the ocean and, and they have, their digestive system allows them to ingest anything that floats on the surface of the water. And so these parent albatrosses are coming back to Midway Island with their body cavities completely filled with toothbrushes, cigarette lighters, magic markers, plastic bottle caps, and other plastic junk. They're feeding it to their babies. And the babies slowly fill up with plastic. They can't cough it back up. Does the baby slowly fill up with plastic until literally they're filled with plastic all the way up until their throat? And they can't ingest any other food, and so they slowly uh, die of starvation and dehydration and choking. And tens of thousands of baby albatross cover Midway Island uh, that have died from ingesting all this plastic. And so I went there and, uh, and made a series of photographs, and here is what they look like. I went in September when, uh, when the babies had begun to decompose. And uh, you can see the, the contents of their body cavities. Not a single piece of plastic in any of, of these photographs was moved even a centimeter or arranged or manipulated. I took, a, th this is, these are direct photographic documentations of the actual stomach contents of these birds more than 2,000 miles from the nearest continent. <coughs> We, uh, we brought Ziploc bags and, and bagged up the, the entire stomach contents of several of the birds, and it was like an entire Ziploc, two baseballs worth of, uh, of garbage. And these birds, whose stomachs were much smaller than that, their stomachs just slowly expanded and expanded and expanded and finally rupture, and, and, and as they're dying on the ground, the, the parent is still trying to force one more cigarette lighter, one more toothbrush down to, to, in, in a desperate attempt to feed their dying young. Tens of thousands of these birds are, uh, cover Midway Island. Um, I want to talk just a little tiny bit about, more about Midway, but first, uh, this is my website. All my work is up on my website, and I open source the work for teachers and anyone who wants to use it for non-commercial purpose. You're, you're, will, you're, you're uh, welcome to use it for free. We send out high-res images for PowerPoint and other stuff like that. Um, so when I, uh, when I came back from Midway, what I, what I had hoped would happen when I went to Midway is that if, if I could fully face one of the horrible environmental tragedies that's happening in the world, like fully stand in front of it, fully witness it, that I would sort of end up going through it and come out the other side with, with some hope or inspiration or, or more passion or something like that. And what actually happened to me out on Midway I brought a team of, of, of other artists with me, a documentary film crew, and my wife, who's a poet, and uh, one of the world's leading activists about ocean plastic pollution. And all five of us were deeply traumatized by the experience. And uh, I've been battling with depression ever since I came back um, last September. And it, it really kind of flipped all of my work on its head for me. Because what I want to do is to honestly face the reality of our world in a way that, you know, comes out of denial. And I want to kind of pass that along and, and, and encourage other people to honestly face the, the reality of our world. And when I really did it, just with one issue, I, I came out of it feeling really hopeless and overwhelmed and panicked. And I think it's something that's happening a lot in our culture right now. And I don't really know what to do about that, except every time I share these feelings and I see other people sharing, it's like when one person feels hopeless all by themselves, then that's a traumatizing, disempowering experience. But as soon as one person says, I feel hopeless, does anybody else here feel hopeless? Just raise your hand if you're feeling a little hopeless these days. Yeah. Look, keep them up and just look around. It, it transforms. The moment that we begin to process these feelings in community, it transforms into something else. And so what I'm, what I'm planning on doing, I'm trying to raise the money right now, I'm going back to Midway to go further into the fire by, I'm gonna go in July when the babies are dying. So I'm gonna bring my film crew and we're actually gonna stand over these babies that are in advanced stages of dehydration and starvation that are flopping in the ground, unable to move, 
going to be dead within a few days, and photograph them and film them. And, uh, and then we're going to go back again in September, when we went last time, and photograph another round of the dead ones. And as a way of, of fully facing the tragedy as much as we can. And then we're, we're going to put out a little film. With, uh, I'm working with Free Range Studios in uh, Berkeley, which is the, uh, that's the organization that created Annie Leonard's film called The Story of Stuff that uh, has reached 10 million school children around the, the world. Working with Free Range Studios, we're going to put out a, a little film that asks the question, what does Hope 2.0 look like? How can we face the horrors of our world fully, allow our heart to be broken by it, and maintain a sense that we, make, we can make a difference, that we can be hopeful? We're going to ask that question. And we're going to bring some school kids with us when we return to the island uh, in the spring when the babies are hatching out of the eggs. And our intention is to hold the, the horror of this tragedy and at the same time turn toward the, the, the mysterious beauty, the primal call to life of these babies, these incredibly cute, fluffy little baby albatross hatching out of the eggs. And to sort of hold these two paradoxical truths of the horror of our world and the beauty of our world. And uh, our hope is that, that by holding those two things and bringing them as close together as we can, that we might at least begin to start a conversation about what, what is the new hope? What's the honest, realistic new hope that we can all move forward with together as we, as we begin to create a new world? So I think I'll end there. I ask that you not applaud. Um, and uh, let's, let's do some question and answer if people are up for that. And uh, if anybody needs to leave, please feel free to. We can be totally informal about that. So uh, questions? Yeah. Uh, he asked me, of all the things to depict, uh, what was it about albatross that I was interested in? And then, and then where do I go from here? Well, um, the, the, the metaphor of Midway is it's really bizarre as, as it has started to unfold. The first thing I learned was that there are lots of albatross in Midway Island that are filled up with plastic. And when I went there and I saw these birds filled with plastic, I just, I, I couldn't help but see myself. You know, it's kind of like a really macabre mirror for American culture, as we fill up our lives with junk. You know, and, you fill, and, and our bodies are filled with plastic. We're all starting to learn how much plastic, how many toxins are inside our own bodies. And uh, so that was one layer of this metaphor. Midway Island is also this, this metaphor for itself. Like, think of all the things it could be named. You know, it could be called Palm Atoll, or Sand Island, or something. But it's called Midway. And here we are, humanity right now, at this Midway place. You know, as the, as the old paradigms, the old ideologies are all in collapse. The systems just aren't working anymore. We have this environmental and cultural catastrophe that we're facing. And the new paradigm has yet to emerge. We're, we're sort of like at this pausing moment where we get to decide. And we're, the world is all sort of becoming aware of this. And we're all saying, OK, what are we going to do? So we're, the world is at a midway point right now. And I also learned, strangely enough, that uh, on Midway, there's this fallen down old military building that is the place where they connected up the Trans-Pacific communication cable for the first time in 1904. And they'd already laid the cable the entire way, the rest of the way around the world. And they went from the coast of the United States toward Asia, and they went from Asia toward the coast of the United States. And they connected it up in this building, on, of all places, on Midway Island. And, th and that was the first global electronic communication. It happened on Midway. And if you think of what has happened since then in terms of global electronic communication, now, now the entire world is is in touch with each other by the internet. And, and the first spark was on Midway Island. And of course, the albatross is this mythic bird that has this, uh, you know, the, the, the rhyme of the ancient mariner by Samuel Taylor Coleridge is this amazingly powerful uh, mythic poem about redemption. Um, and uh, so the, the, the metaphor of Midway just keeps, to, keep, keeps on expanding the more I, the, the further I go. And I, uh, I so look forward to going back there to truly amazing place where there's this, this incredibly symbolic and macabre evidence of man's impact on the environment. And at the same time, there are a million albatross 
that live there on the island. And if you divide the number of albatross into the square footage of the island, there's a mating pair of albatross for every square meter. When they're there on the island, the, everything has to go in slow motion. When the plane comes into land, they have to get a crew of guys out there to scoot all the albatross off the island. The plane can only, uh, can only land at, at 3 in the morning because otherwise the air is totally filled with birds all day long. So at 3 in the morning, the plane comes in and all these guys are out scooting albatross off the runway. And when the plane taxis to the hangar, by the time it gets there, the runway is covered with birds again. Just this, I've never seen such abundance. It's, it's almost, I almost felt panic when I was out there. So many birds. And at the same time, this incredible tragedy happening. It's like the, 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 the horror of, of what is and also the beauty of what is and, and what could be is so juxtaposed there. I think it's, there's a really powerful metaphor. Boy, that was a really long answer to the first question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. Well, she, she asked me um, specifically about plastic cups and airlines, but with, with my other work as well, if, uh, if companies have responded to my work with some sort of policy changes. Um, I haven't, I'm not aware, oh yes, uh, Whole Foods. Remember when they banned plastic bags? It's because of my piece. The, the, uh, the CEO of Whole Foods uh, sent me an email and said that he saw me at the TED conference. So yeah, that's, that's the thing probably that I'm the most proud of it, with my work. But, but other than that, I, I haven't heard directly that my work has had effect on companies like that. Um, but you know, lots of people write and say that they've begun to make changes. And, and the thing is, I mean, here's what I really believe about that. There are thousands of people who are out there advocating, just like I am. You know, there are teachers who are teaching about it. There are documentary filmmakers who are making films about it. There are writers who are writing about it. There are parents who are teaching their kids about it. It's like this message is coming from tons of different directions. And my guess is that, you know, if someone writes me a, a note that says, I stopped drinking water out of plastic bottles when I saw your piece, they had probably already heard that message like 50 times previously and they were, they were just on the edge. And maybe my piece pushed them over the edge. But then if, if another company, you know, if the airline see this, sees this piece and they don't make any policy change, maybe that's just one straw on the camel's back and then they'll, they'll see other straws. They'll hear passengers complaining about it. Every flight I go on, I complain. Uh, just tell the stewardess, I can't believe you guys are still using plastic cups. That's disgusting. Please pass that on to somebody. And uh, if they hear that enough times, you know, if they receive enough emails, then uh, finally there'll be enough straws on the camel's back. And it's happening all over the place. They're, you know, the, the great turning is happening. It's, it's going slowly, and uh, it's kind of happening under the radar, but it is happening. So uh, I, feel, I feel really hopeful. Um, but for it to continue happening, and for it to happen in time, it's going to take more people than are currently working on it. And, 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 and it's spreading as well. It's, uh, Well, here, this is the interesting thing. Um, if, if you look at the, the, uh, the plastic bottles, the two million plastic bottles back there, um, I, uh, I was standing in front of that piece at uh, the Boulder Museum of Art in Boulder, Colorado, where that piece was being exhibited. And a friend of mine was with me, and we're standing in front of the piece together, and he's drinking water out of a plastic bottle. And he's like, oh, just a sec. He finished the bottle, and he goes and throws it in the garbage. And he comes back, and we're standing there, and, and he, he felt a little guilty, so he said, that's just one bottle. <laughs> and then he looked at the piece, and I saw him sort of get this shock, and he's like, oh my god, I just got it. That's two million one bottles. <laughs> so if you want to know if the individual makes a difference, all you have to look at is where we got to here, because we've all been acting like we don't make a difference. And the result is an environmental and cultural catastrophe. And so if we all act like we do make a difference collectively, then I think it will have the same kind of scale in its effect. But here's the problem. This is the problem I face myself, and I think this is the problem that each one of us faces. If everybody else would just do it, then I wouldn't have to. <laughs> and if I do it, but everybody else doesn't do it, then the world won't be healed, and I won't make a difference. So each one of us can be a free rider in this world change, and if everybody decides to be a free rider, which is kind of what, what most of us have been doing up until now, just because we weren't aware, but if everybody's a free rider, then the catastrophe continues. So the real question is, how can we collectively begin to make new choices? And it's happening. It's happening already. Millions of people are, 
are, uh, are changing their behavior and it's, it's happening you know, inside corporations, it's happening in, in universities, some of our biggest institutions, even inside our government. It's happening everywhere at once and it's, it's, it's spreading fast. And uh, there, you know, there, of course, there are a lot of forces against it. These giant corporations that don't want to stop making the profits that they make from selling plastic junk, for example. But that's changing too. We just got to keep at it. Lexus is making bicycles now. Nice. Yeah, they can see the future. <laughs> so, yeah. Have you seen a piece that glorifies or shows that positive effect and that positive change? And as you know, I would imagine it's pretty easy to get overwhelmed with the hopelessness and despair of all the tragedies in the world. So have you considered you know, creating a piece that shows the hope? Well, I've, uh, I've taken one stab at, at doing a piece that's about hope. Um, and it's on my website if you want to look at it. I haven't exhibited it yet because it's, it's huge and I, I just haven't found a, a place to exhibit it. But uh, what I did was I collaborated with Paul Hawken, who, uh, who wrote a book called Blessed Unrest, which is about the, the Green Movement. And Paul Hawken hired a whole bunch of researchers to collect the names of all the organizations on Earth that are devoted to peace, uh, environmental stewardship, social justice, and the preservation of diverse and indigenous culture. And he came up with, uh, with 130,000 organizations. But by the process of their research, they estimated that the actual number of those organizations is between one and two million around the world. So he shared with me his entire database of 130,000 organizations, and I just duplicated it a few times until I had a million names of organizations devoted to those things. And then I reduced, it, it, it was in a straight line, I reduced it to a six point font, which is a font that's so small that you have to get up really, really close to read it. It's smaller than the font in a phone book. And at that size font, the line of names is 27 miles long. <laughs> and then I used a computer program to make a mandala, a huge uh, mandala, where I took 108 points around a circle, connected every point with every other point, so it just makes this fantastically complex and really cool looking uh, giant circular mandala thing out of all the names of those organizations. And at a, at a six point font, the size of the mandala is 50 feet in diameter, which is pretty close to the width of this room. So imagine, uh, and, and equally high, five stories high. So imagine this massive uh, solid mass of names of all the organizations in the world in, in a six point font. And I haven't had a chance to, to print it and exhibit it anywhere yet. But, and it's hard because it's kind of, uh, it's kind of sterile. You know, it's, it's, it's entirely mathematical. There aren't any brush strokes or there's not a lot of artistry in it. But at the same time, it's, it's an illustration of just how many people in the world there are that, that are trying to live by these new principles of, of compassion and community. And uh, I, I hope to do something else um, because I think we really need that right now. Uh, you mentioned that it took you two months for the to collect two point three million personal funds. Is that a typical amount of time for uh, some chart work? Some of them go a little faster. The jet trails uh, just took me a few days of just pasting jet trails like crazy <laughs> on, a, on a canvas, um, and this one took me a little longer than that. Um, and uh, I'm working on one. I just started one right now that I think it's going to be the. It's going to be the biggest image file I've created. Oh, by the way, for any uh, Photoshop computer type geeks here, the, uh, the, the image files that I make are all many gigabytes. And the biggest one that I've done is the, uh, the brown paper supermarket bags, which is around the corner there that looks like uh, trees. That image file was 84 gigabytes. And uh, it was a, a nightmare of crashing computers and corrupting <laughs> files and so on. But uh, Apple just gave me their brandest, newest totally tricked out Mac. And uh, I'm going to use it to build this new piece, which is going to be the same height, but uh, 16 feet instead of 11. So it'll be out to about there, um, made out of uh, plastic from the Pacific Garbage Patch. Um, and uh, I won't tell you what the image yet is, because I'm not sure if I can do it, but uh, stay tuned. Well, he asked, uh, he asked if people are buying my artwork. And uh, they were back before the, the economy crashed. Um, but. Uh, the, the art market has just totally crashed. You know, it's like if you make a pyramid of what 
what people spend their um, disposable income on. You know, down here, down here is like rent and food, and then going to movies and going to restaurants and buying jewelry, and the, like the very, very last thing is art. And as soon as the economy takes a dip, people stop buying art, and uh, my income just disappeared when the economy crashed. It's been kind of scary, but I've been, you know, I've had the really good fortune. I've been bail bailed out a couple times by uh, foundations who have given me grants, and uh, I'm still still searching around for funds to get back to Midway. The flight to Midway is ridiculously expensive because it's from Honolulu out to Midway is the same distance as from Tijuana to Vancouver, British Columbia, straight out over the Pacific Ocean. And it's so weird because if you look at a map of the North Pacific, here's Hawaii and there's Midway. And that's from Vancouver to, to, uh, to, to Tijuana. And so, so we have to fly from, sorry. It's not really a home journey thing either, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah well, we, we start in Honolulu. You know, we can get to Honolulu, but from Midway, you have to make a round trip from Honolulu to Midway to drop us back to Honolulu, and then a couple weeks later, Honolulu to Midway to pick us up back to Honolulu, and it's $30,000 per flight. You have to rent the whole plane, have to charter a plane for $30,000. So it costs $60,000 to just go to Midway with, uh, with a crew. And the last time we went, we uh, hitchhiked on a plane that was full of food. We were sitting on like crates of bananas and stuff as, you know, for the four and a half hour flight. But uh, we don't know if we're gonna be able to do that in the future, and we wanna bring um, high-definition camera gear. You know, we wanna, uh, when we go in the spring, what our hope is, is uh, we're going we're gonna to broadcast live from the island. And I might be working with National Geographic or Discovery Channel or something like that. We want to bring equipment that we can, you know, blog and broadcast uh, to, to people can, so they can follow us live. Um, so anyway, it's, it's a technical challenge. Last question. What do I hope the world will be like in 10 years? Well. This is where I start sounding naive. <laughs> um, it, you know, the thing that keeps me awake at night is that we could change. We could do it. And there's all this inertia. It feels like there's, an, there's this inertia. But I have a sense that just around the corner there's a paradigm shift. And I don't know what it is yet. Nobody knows what it is yet. But I, I just, I think it's going to happen. I think we're going to make the change that we all are imagining. And what I'm imagining like my own personal version of it, is what we're stuck in is this paradigm of the world's a bad place and we got to fix it. But we can't because it's so bad and there's so much force that doesn't want it's to. Like, it's like we're in this war like this and we, we can't seem to get out of that. And the other paradigm we're in is the economy is the most important thing and, the, and, and we don't want to change our lifestyles. And that's another... It's like, it's, it's this mindset or paradigm or whatever you call it that, and, and I, I love reading Rumi, the poet Rumi. And here's what Rumi, here's one of his poems. He says, out there beyond notions of right doing and wrong doing, there's a field. I will meet you there. And that's kind of like, if, if you think about that poem, what, what it says to me is if you can figure out the way out of this, there's another answer out there that's, that makes this totally obsolete. And I don't know what that is, but I have a feeling that, that beauty is somehow a part of that. And this is, this is my quest uh, on Midway, is not to go back into denial about how bad the world is, not to turn away from the, from the realities, from the harsh realities and the horrors of our world, to hold all of that and turn toward beauty. And I think as, as a people, as a culture, as a civilization, if we could turn back to beauty, back to the sacredness of the miracle that we all get to experience by being alive, back to music, back to art, then fixing our problems, I, I, I just have a sense that it, it might happen much more easily than, than we think it, it would. So let's call it an evening. Please don't clap. Oh, boy. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much.